and we're going to start chapter 15, which takes place on the day before Boxing Day. In real life, this was recorded on Boxing Day of 2016, so a little bit of synchronicity there. Let's hope that this is a more exciting chapter to listen to than the last one. It was Christmas night, the eve of the Boxing Day meet. You must remember that this was in the, in the old Merry England, when the rosy barons ate with their fingers and had peacocks served before them with their tail feathers steaming, or boar's heads with the tusks stuck in again, when there was no unemployment because there were too few people to be unemployed, when the forests rang with knights walloping each other on the helm, and the unicorns and wintry moonlight stamped with their silver feet and snorted their noble breaths of blue upon the frozen air. These marvels were great and comfortable ones. But in the old England, there was a greater still. The weather behaved itself. In the spring, all the little flowers came out obediently in the meads, and the dew sparkled and the birds sang in the summer. It was beautifully hot for no less than four months, and if it did rain just enough for agricultural purposes, they managed to arrange it so that it rained while you were in bed. In the autumn, the leaves flamed and rattled before the west winds, tempering their sad adieu with glory, and in the winter, which was confined by stature to two months, which was confined by statute to two months, the snow lay evenly, three feet thick, but never turned into slush. It was Christmas night in the castle of the Forest Sauvage, and all around the castle the snow lay as it ought to lay. It hung heavily on the battlements, like extremely thick icing on a very good cake, and in a few convenient places it modestly turned itself into the clearest icicles of the greatest possible length. It hung on the boughs of the forest trees, in rounded lumps, even better than apple blossoms, and occasionally slid off the roofs of the village when it saw a chance of falling upon some amusing character and giving pleasure to all. The boys made snowballs with it, but never put stones in them to hurt each other, and the dogs, when they were taken out to Scombry, bit it and rolled in it, and looked surprised but delighted when it vanished into bigger drifts when they vanished into the bigger drifts. There was skating on the moat which roared all day with the glittering with the gliding steel, while hot chestnuts and spiced mead were served on the bank to all and sundry. The owls hooted, the cooks put out the crumbs they could for the small birds, the villagers brought out their red mufflers, Sir Ector's face shone redder even than these, and reddest of all shone the cottage fires all down the main street of an evening, while the winds howled outside, the old English wolves wandered about, slavering in an appropriate manner, or sometimes peeping in at keyholes with their blood-red eyes. It was Christmas night, and all the proper things had been done. The whole village had come to dinner in the hall. There had been boar's head and venison and pork and beef and mutton and capons, but no turkey on account of this bird not having yet been invented. There had been plum pudding and snapdragons with blue fire on the tips, of, the, of one's fingers, and so much and as much mead as anybody could drink. Sir Ector's health had been drunk with best respects, Meester, and best compliments of the season, my lords and ladies, and many of them. There had been murmurs to play. There had been mummers to play an exciting dramatic presentation of a story in which Saint George, and a Saracen, and a very funny doctor did some surprising things. Also, carol singers who rendered Adiste Filides and I sing of the maiden in a high clear tenor in high clear tenor voices. After that, those children who had not been sick over their dinner played Hood Man Blind and other appropriate games, while the young men and maidens danced Morris dances in the middle, and tables having been cleared away, the old folks sat round the walls holding glasses of mead in their hands, and feeling thankful that they were past all such capers, hoppings and skippings while those children who had been sick with them and soon went to sleep, the small heads leaning against their shoulders. At the high table, Sir Ector sat with his knightly guests, who had come for the, for the morrow's hunting, smiling and nodding and drinking burgundy or sherry's sack or malmsey wine. After a bit, silence was prayed for Sir Grumor. He stood up, 
after a bit, silence was prayed for, by, prayed for Sir Grumor. He stood up and sang his old school song amidst great applause, but forgot most of it and had to make a humming noise in his mustache. Then King Pellinore was nudged to his feet and sang bashfully, Oh, I was born at Pellinore, in famous Lincolnshire. Full well I, cle I chased the questing beast for more than seventeen year, till I took up with Sir Grumor here in this season of the year. Since when tis my delight on a feather bed night to sleep at home, my dear. You see, exclaimed King Pellinore, blushing, as he sat down with everybody, whacking him on the back. Old Grumor invited me home. What well, after we had been having a splendid joust together, and since then I have been letting my beastly beast go and hang itself on the wall. What? Well done, they all told him. You live your own life while you've got it. William Twighty was called for, who had arrived on the previous evening, and the famous huntsman stood up with a perfectly straight face, his crooked eye fixed upon Sir Ector, to sing, Dear Ken William Twighty, with his jerkin so dagged. Dear Ken William Twighty, who never yet lagged, Yes, I can, William Twighty, and he ought to be gagged with his hounds and his horn in the morning. Bravo, said Sir Hector. Did you hear that? Said he ought to be gagged, my dear fellow. Blast if I don't think he was go didn't think he was going to boast when he began. <laughs> Splendid chaps, these huntsmen, eh? Pass Master Twighty the Malmsey with my compliments. The boys lay curled under the benches near the fire, wart with Cavill in his arms. Cavill did not like the heat and the shouting and the smell of mead, and wanted to go away, but Wart held him tightly because he needed something to hug, and Cavill had to stay with him, perforce panting over a long pink tongue. Now, Ralph Passelweave, cried Sir Ector, and all his villains cried, Ralph Passelweave, good wold Ralph, who killed the cow, Ralph, pray silence for Master Passelweave that couldn't help it. At this, the most lovely old man got up, at the very furthest and humblest end of the hall, as he had got up on all similar occasions for the past half-century, he was no less than eighty-seven years of age, almost blind, almost dumb, almost deaf, but still able and willing and happy to quaver out the same old song which he had sung for the pleasure of the forest sauvage since before Sir Ector was bound up in a kind of tight linen putee in his cradle. They could not hear him at the high table, he was much too far away. Time to be able to reach across a room, but everyone knew that the cracked old voice was singing, and everybody loved it. This is what he sang. When an old king Ko was awakened down the street, he saw a lovely lady a stepping in a portal. She lifted up her skirt for to hop across her middle, and he saw her and Kale. Wasn't that a fuddle? He couldn't help it, he had to. There are about twenty verses of this song, in which Wold King Cole helplessly saw more, more and more things that he ought not to have seen. And everybody cheered at the end of each verse until at the conclusion, old Ralph was overwhelmed with congratulations and sat down, smiling dimly, to a replenished mug of mead. It was now Sir Ector's turn to wind up the proceedings. He stood up importantly and delivered the following speech. Friends, tenants, and otherwise, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, there was a faint cheer at this, for everybody recognized the speech which Sir Ector had made for the last twenty years and welcomed it like a brother. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, it is my pleasant duty, I might say my very pleasant duty, to welcome all and sundry to our little homely feast. It has been a good year, and I say it without fear of contradiction. In pasture and plough, we all know how Crumbock of Forest Savage won the first prize at Cardoil Castle Show for the second time, and one more year will win the cup of outright. More power to the forest of Arj as we sit down tonight. I notice some faces now gone from amongst us, and some which have added to the family circle. Such matters are in the hands of the almighty province, to which we all feel thankful. We ourselves have been first created 
and then spared to enjoy the rejoicing of this pleasant evening. I think we are all grateful for the blessings which have been showered upon us. Tonight we welcome to our midst the famous King Pelinor, whose labors in riding our forest of the redoubtable question beast are known to us all. Bless! God bless King Pelinor. Here, here. Also, Sir Grummer Grummerson, a sportsman, though I say it to his face, who will stick to his mount as long as his quest will stand in front of him. Hooray! Finally, last but not least, we are honored to have a visit from His Majesty's most famous huntsman, Master William Twighty, who will, I feel sure, show us some sport tomorrow that we will rub our eyes and wish for a royal pack of hounds could always be hunted in the forest, which we all love so well. View, halloo, and several reach its blue in, the, in imitation. Thank you, my dear friends, for your spontaneous welcome of these gentlemen. They will, I know, accept it in the true and warm-hearted spirit in which it was offered. And now it is time I should bring my brief remarks to a close. Another year has almost sped, and it is time we should be looking forward to the challenge in the future. What about the castle show next? What about the cattle show next year? Friends, I can only wish you a very Merry Christmas. And after Reverend Side Bottom has said our grace for us, we shall conclude with the singing of the national anthem. The cheers w which broke out at the end of Sir Ector's speech were only just prevented by several hushes from drown from drowning the last part of the vicar's grace in Latin. Then everybody stood up loyally in the firelight and sang, God bless King, God save King Pendragon, may his reign long drag on. God save the king, sent him most glorious, great and uproarious, horrible and horrious. God save our king. The last notes died away as the hall emptied of its rejoicing humanity. Lanterns flickered outside in the village street as everybody went home in bands for fear of moonlit wolves, and the castle of the forest sauvage slept peacefully and lightless in the strange silence of the holy snow. And that is the end of chapter 15.